Welcome to lecture eight of module seven. We finally gotten to hydrogen. This is the single most important problem we're going to be studying in the entire class. Congratulations, we finally made it. This is the most important problem in the entire class. We're going to solve for the quantum mechanics of hydrogen. This problem can be solved exactly. And in the course of doing so, we're going to encounter just a wide range of very interesting and marvelous phenomenon. To sort of set the stage, I just want to introduce you to a book by John Rigdon, which is called Hydrogen, the Essential Element. I highly recommend it. He has a premise in this book that it's high precision measurements of hydrogen and the fact that we have an exact, an exact solution for hydrogen that is responsible for many of the developments in physics in the 20th century, spanning lasers and quantum field theory and radio astronomy and so forth. There's a lot of areas where hydrogen plays an absolutely essential role. And what I'm going to explain to you in using the solutions that we get is that there are really many things that we can do with these solutions. So I'm going to give you a top 10 list of the things that we can do with our solutions for hydrogen. Number one is we can explain the atomic spectra. That's the sharp lines that you see when you put light through a spectroscope. We can measure the mass of the proton. You might not believe that, but just by measuring light, we can measure the mass of the proton. I'll show you how we can do that. We can discover the deuteron. We can discover that there's an extra isotope, a second and even third, but really this was used primarily for the deuteron, that there are isotopes of hydrogen. We can determine that electrons have spin. We can understand why the so-called G factor, which is associated with the spin and how the spin reacts to a magnetic field of an electron, why its value is two, and also why when we take into account quantum field theory corrections, the value is slightly bigger than two. We can establish the need for quantum field theory, in part by looking at things like the measurement of the G factor, but also looking at something called the fine structure of hydrogen. We're not going to be covering fine structure in detail, but that is something that you actually have an exact solution for. So it's remarkable how well that works. We can determine that the proton has spin, and this is something that's used in radio astronomy. And we can measure what is called the charge radius of the proton simply by looking at light. We can determine not only the proton mass, but the effective size of the proton as well. And I want to, I actually lied, it's top nine, not top 10 list. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, hydrogen touches on the fields of radio astronomy, quantum field theory, medical imaging like MRI and so forth, many of the most important things and applications of quantum mechanics actually are deriving from looking at the exact solution of hydrogen. So it's a really important thing. So I don't know about you, but I feel like this is pretty amazing stuff. So let's be concrete and exactly explain what the Coulomb problem is. We have to begin with the Hamiltonian for hydrogen. And of course, the Hamiltonian has the kinetic energy divided by the reduced mass, because the hydrogen is really a two-body system of an electron and a proton, and we map it to an effective single-body system using the reduced mass, which is the product of the electron mass times the proton mass divided by the sum. And this mass is about 0.2% different from the bare electron mass. And then we have the Coulomb interaction term, which is minus E squared over R. It's the same potential as we have for gravity as well. And that's essentially just Coulomb's law for two interacting point charges, each which have the exact same charge, but opposite signs where the magnitude of the charge is given by E. Now, as before, this is a central force problem, so we're going to separate variables. We're going to rewrite the kinetic energy in terms of the radial momentum squared and the angular momentum squared. We're going to use the tensor product for the wave function, which allows us to evaluate the L squared acting on the LM eigenstate which gives back an h bar squared times an l times an l plus one. And so we now have an infinite number of different Hamiltonians that we're going to be working with, that we're going to call those Hamiltonians hl, and they're given here by pr squared over 2m plus h bar squared l times l plus one over 2m r squared. 
minus e squared over r. And I want to remind you that we're using this maximally commuting set of the Hamiltonian L squared and LZ like we always do with the central force problems. And we're doing that tensor product decomposition of the wave function, or if you like, of the eigenfunction. And so we're actually focusing here on solving the radial problem. The superpotential, you know, look at our potential. We've got terms that go like 1 over r squared and terms that go like 1 over r. Since I have to square the superpotential, the most obvious guess is to pick something that goes like 1 over r plus a constant. When I square that, I'll get a 1 over r squared. I'll get a 1 over r from the cross term, and I'll get a constant. But constants are fine. We actually get constants when we do our factorization method. When I look at the commutator of momentum, radial momentum with 1 over r, I'll get something that goes like 1 over r squared. That's also OK. We need a term like that. And then commutator with a constant gives 0. So looking just at that simple evaluation of what do I get when I take the commutator of the superpotential and what do I get when I square the superpotential, taking 1 over r plus a constant should work. And then we just have to make sure that in the limit as r goes to infinity, we approach 0 from a positive side. And as r goes to 0, we have a divergence, and the divergence has a negative coefficient. Those are our two rules for getting the right superpotential. So we're going to denote the latter operators with a slightly different notation. I'm going to use b sub r of l. The r is to indicate that I'm doing this in the radial perspective. And the l is just a label that we have. It's the l label that we're using with our al. But we're using these b notation because we're going to be introducing Cartesian operators to factorize the Hamiltonian later in a couple of lectures. And for those, we're going to be using a operators. So I want to just make sure we don't have a confusion there. So I'm using B operators here. In some sense, it's a special operator for the Coulomb problem. It is a special problem. It's really the most important problem that we can solve in quantum mechanics. Now, I want to introduce something called the Bohr radius. Right now, you can just think of it as a definition. It's h bar squared over m e squared. And if you go ahead and you calculate what that is, you find it's about 0.0529 nanometers. Sometimes people like to record the Bohr radius in angstroms. In that case, it's 0.529 angstroms. An angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. So this lowering operator, Br of L, it of course has the 1 over square root of 2m, like everything does with m, the reduced mass. It has the radial momentum, minus i h bar times k times the superpotential. I'm going to write that superpotential as alpha L over a0 plus beta L over r. Alpha L and beta L must both be constants that are numbers because h bar over a length is a momentum and that's the dimensionality that we need. So alpha L and beta L are just numbers in this calculation. So now what we have to do is we have to compute B dagger R of L, B R of L. That's going to be 1 over 2M. I'm going to get a PR squared. I get minus I h bar times the commutator of PR with alpha L over A0 plus beta L over R hat plus H bar squared alpha L over A0 plus beta L over R hat quantity squared. The commutator of PR with a constant is 0. Commutator of PR with 1 over R is I H bar over R squared. And of course, I can square those terms in that last term, which is the square of the superpotential. And what we find is we get PR squared plus H bar squared beta L over R squared. That came from the commutator. And then I have the three terms when I foil out the square of the superpotential. H bar squared alpha L squared over A0 squared plus 2 H bar squared alpha L beta L over A0 R plus H bar squared beta L squared over R squared. We're now going to take a look at how do I set those up so that I get the Hamiltonian. Clearly, beta L times beta L plus 1. You see I have two terms that are go like h bar squared over r squared. I can factor them out as beta L times beta L plus 1. That has to equal L times L plus 1 because I already have that factor of 1 over 2M. And there are two solutions to that. One is beta L equals L. The other is beta L equals minus L plus 1. Because we need to have a negative coefficient on the term that diverges as r goes to 0, we need to pick beta L equals minus L plus 1. Uh, we also need 2 h bar squared alpha L beta L over A0 to equal minus E squared. If I plug in what A0 is, it's equal to h bar squared over M E squared. I'm going to get some simplifications there. And what we're going to find is in order for that to equal minus E squared, 
because a zero is h bar squared over me squared you see the h bar squareds cancel there's a 2m coming from outside that's going to cancel with the two in the numerator and with the m that comes from the a zero uh, i have an e squared coming from the a zero that's in the denominator that goes to the numerator alpha l is the thing i need to set beta l is equal to minus l plus one the minus signs will cancel and clearly the only way that this is going to work is to have alpha l equals one over l plus one so alpha l is equal to one over l plus one indeed that is positive and it has to be positive so that I have a positive superpotential and limit as r goes to infinity. And then I can plug in the constant terms. Those are going to be the h bar squared alpha l squared over a zero squared. I have to take the negative of that to get the energy. I'm going to call that el auxiliary. That equals minus e squared over 2 l plus 1 quantity squared a zero and you can see there's some simplification that has gone into that in order to get it into that form, taking into account the fact that h bar squared over m times a zero is equal to uh, e squared. And so I get rid of one of the a zeros by converting it and getting rid of factors of h bar squared and m. So those are the constants that we need. Please pause the video and carefully work out what these constants are if you're having any trouble. I can actually see in this expression with the 2h bar squared alpha l beta l over a0, that whole thing should actually equal minus 2m times e squared. I forgot about the 2m, or I should divide that by 2m when I'm working this out. That is the way that I explained it to you, but in, the, in this PowerPoint, it has a slight error there. All right, so here's the summary of everything that we have learned. Let's now move on to our intertwining relationship. Again, we're going to use the shortcut to find all of the energy eigenstates of all Hamiltonians at once by using the intertwining relation. We're going to calculate this intertwining relation very carefully. I have to calculate BR, BR dagger plus EL auxiliary. Remember that BR, BR dagger is just BR dagger, BR plus the commutator. But BR dagger BR plus EL auxiliary, that's just equal to HL. So I now I have to calculate this commutator. I have to plug in what those results are. There's a factor of 2 that cancels with the, one, the 2 and the 1 over 2M. I have a PR with the super potential commutator. There's an IH bar 1 over L plus 1A0 minus L plus 1 over R. The commutator with the constant is 0. The commutator with the 1 over R is going to give me IH bar over r squared and so we're going to find that this is equal to h l plus h bar squared l plus one over m r squared when all of the dust settles and you can see here now when i plug in what h l is h l is equal to p r squared over 2m plus h bar squared l times l plus one over 2m r squared minus e squared over r you can see here that I can bring that h bar squared L plus 1 over mr squared. That acts like an h bar squared times a 2 when I put it over a 2 mr squared. So I'm adding 2 L plus 1 in the numerator. That gives me an L plus 2 times an L plus 1. So when I combine those together, but notice that's h L plus 1. And so what we find, and this is the really nice result, is the angular momentum ham Hamiltonians in this case actually are the auxiliary Hamiltonians. So we're essentially done. We now can solve everything because we get all of the solutions of the auxiliary Hamiltonians just by solving the first one, the first Hamiltonian. We get all the eigenfunctions. So we have everything. This means we can immediately jump to the eigenstates for all of the Hamiltonians all at once. And we're going to denote the principal quantum number as n. This is the customary thing to do. It corresponds to the energy where we replace L plus 1 by n for the EL auxiliary. And we're going to call that En. All right, so now we have to recall our subsidiary condition. Br of L acting on psi n equals L plus 1 comma L. This is the lowest energy eigenstate that has angular momentum L. It's also the Lth auxiliary Hamiltonian ground state. Because those Hamiltonians are the same, it's the same thing. That operator acting on that state is equal to zero. And using that result allows us to calculate and construct the energy eigenstates in the exact same way as we did before. The eigenstate of H L minus M is given we call that psi n L minus M. It's B dagger R of L minus M, B dagger R 
of L minus M plus one all the way out to B dagger R of L minus one acting on the auxiliary Hamiltonian ground state, which we call psi of N equals L plus one comma L. It's an eigenstate of H L minus M with energy E N equals minus E squared over two N squared A zero. Remember all the energies for all of the terms along the same row of the auxiliary Hamiltonians, they're all the same. And this proof is essentially then identical to what we've done before. And I'm not gonna repeat it here because you've seen it many times. Note that I can continue this chain all the way out until M equals L. After that, if I try to construct B dagger R of minus one, I find that I have a divide by zero in the one over A zero term. So that operator is undefined. So I have to stop when L is equal to, when M is equal to L. And this is what the energy eigenstates look like when we plug in those energies because they go like one over N squared. There's a huge gap between the first and the second. It's a smaller gap to the third and then it gets smaller and smaller. And there's a, an accumulation point at zero. When we plug in those Hamiltonians in terms of the auxiliary energies, I think of those as the auxiliary Hamiltonians, but then we construct our eigenstates and I've just written them in for you with the auxiliary eigenstates, the different B daggers and so forth. You know how all of this goes. But then I just wanna remind you that we're using a slightly different notation using the N uh, to call E N the energies of these states. And this is what our energy level diagram looks like with the energy eigenstates put on top of it. We also can just carefully look at this energy level diagram. You can see you get this compression as we approach that limit point, which is given by that dashed line, as we look at the higher and higher energy eigenvalue eigenstates. So the energy levels really bunch together as N increases, and it actually becomes difficult to show them on these kinds of plots. The other thing to notice is that we have this degeneracy across the horizontal. So both n equals two, all in n equals three, all n equals four, all of those energy levels are degenerate. They're all exactly the same energy. Now this is what happens when the auxiliary Hamiltonians are actually physical Hamiltonians in the factorization method. So you might not be surprised that we're seeing that. But as I had mentioned before, anytime we see degenerate lines, that's an indication that there's some extra symmetry. And it turns out for the hydrogen model, that extra symmetry is something called SO4 symmetry. We're not gonna have the time to go into detail about exactly what that is, but it's essentially rotations in a four-dimensional space rather than a three-dimensional space. And why it's SO4 for the hydrogen atom actually is related to the fact that in planetary motion, when you studied the universal law of gravitation, there was an extra vector that was conserved called the Runga lens vector. If you're familiar with that vector, the fact that that vector is conserved is what leads to or is a manifestation of the fact that there is this extra symmetry. And in fact, that is what Pauli used to solve for the hydrogen spectra before even the Schrodinger equation was invented. Now, because all of those states are degenerate, let's count how many states have the same energy. So looking for fixed N, we have all of the angular momentum up to L equals N minus one. Now, if you recall that every angular momentum L has a degeneracy of two L plus one, then you see we just have to add those up. So we have to add up the total of degeneracy summing from L equals zero to N minus one of two L plus one. If I focus on the one term, you see there just are N of those terms because I'm summing from L equals zero to N minus one. So that contribution is just N. If you look at the two L piece, you go back and look in physics 155. We showed how you can sum the first n minus one integers and the sum there is equal to n minus one times n divided by two and I have to multiply by the two that's in front of the two L and I get n times n minus one. When I add the n to that, you see lo and behold, you get n squared. So the degeneracy for each n is given by n squared in terms of the different angular momentum states that are degenerate. I wanna talk a little bit about the energy scales. The rest mass of an electron, MEC squared, is 510, nearly 511,000 electron volts. We usually approximate it as 511,000 electron volts. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as 511 keV or sometimes 0.511 MeV. The ground state energy of hydrogen is E squared over 2A naught. If you go and you calculate that out, you find it's approximately 
13.6 electron volts. That number, 13.6 electron volts, which is safe to use in any calculations we're going to use in this class, that is a number that's called a Rydberg. I, you also want to recall that A0 is h bar squared over me squared, and that's 0 0.0529 nanometers. Using the Rydberg, using the value of A0, and using the fact that h bar C is equal to 1,240 EV nanometers, that will, uh, over 2 pi EV nanometers, that will actually simplify lots of your calculations. I do not recommend you go out and try to work these things out in the SI units. It's horribly painful to do any of that. But just by manipulating using multiply by one and this and that, remembering the rest mass energy of the electron, remembering the Rydberg, E squared over 2A0 is 13.6 electron volts, recalling what the Bohr radius is, and recalling this identity, H bar C is, 1240 over 2 pi EV nanometers, it's going to simplify a lot of your calculations. And you'll see that when I do demonstration calculations for you. All right, the energies that you find for the different energy levels, the first one is 13.6 EV, the next one is 3.4 EV, then 1.5 EV, then 0 0.85 EV, and so forth. You can see they're getting progressively smaller and smaller as they eventually approach zero. When an electron moves and makes a transition from one energy level to another, which happens when we shine light on an atom, it emits a photon whose energy is given by the energy difference between those energy levels. And so it's actually the differences between the energies that correspond to the light that we're going to see coming out. Most atoms have energy levels with energy differences that is in this few EV range for the outermost electrons. And that corresponds to optical light. And that's why we see striking colors in materials like neon lights or sodium lights or krypton lights and so forth. And chemists use this. You probably did flame tests. I did them actually, I think, as early as perhaps middle school, but certainly I did them in high school, where you take some compound and you put it in a Bunsen burner and you look at the color of the flame. And those flame tests are actually determining the atoms in the compound based on the color that comes out in the flame. Uh, so I just want to detail again for you how this photo production works. There's a selection rule in, photo, in uh, photo production from hydrogen. The strongest transitions occur between energy levels that change their angular momentum, delta L by plus or minus one. And that corresponds to then the strongest one being from N equals two to N equals one. Uh, but if I do any of those L equals 1 down to the N equals 1 state, all of those are called Lyman lines, and that series is called the Lyman series. If I look at transitions that go to the N equals 2 state, those lines are called Balmer series or Balmer lines. And it turns out that the Balmer series is the one that's in the optical range, which you can kind of get by looking at those different energy levels and their differences. And the Lyman series is in the ultraviolet. And with that, we've come to the end of lecture eight of module seven. I hope that you've been able to understand how we got the eigenstates of hydrogen. There's still a lot more that we have to do with hydrogen to get through all of those items in the list that I talked about. And we are gonna cover nearly all of them in the class. But for now, that's the end of the lecture today.